Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And man, are we in for a treat today. The great Jeff Darrow in-house, uh, co-creator of Hard Boiled, big guy in Rusty the Boy Robot, uh, one of the visionaries behind The Matrix, and his own comics masterpieces, Shaolin Cowboy. And he's going to join us today to go through Mobius's The Long Tomorrow. Uncle Jeff, when, when's that? Uh, what's the name of the new Shaolin Cowboy and when is that coming out? Uh, the new one is it, the 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 story's titled "Cruel to Be Kin," which is a play on words and one of my favorite songs by Nick Lowe called "Cruel to Be Kind," and uh, it comes out I think May eighteenth. Could be wrong. How well informed I am. I'm not. I'm not very good at self promotion. <laughs> we are very good at self promotion, and uh, we did variant covers for Shaolin she Cowboy. Did. That part was We're announced. But we talked to the publicity guys over there, and they said that uh, we can't show off the covers until uh, until he gets them shown off. So I think they're gonna show. I think they're gonna show yours, uh, Ed, this this week. Super cool. Yes. So this ain't the uh, this ain't the first time. This ain't the first rodeo with Jeff Darrow on Cartoonist Kayfabe. And one of the things we wanted to do was to bring in our our buds to go take a look at. Uh, you know, comics that were sort of moved the needle for uh, for the individual. And you cited this Long Tomorrow uh, story by Mobius and, and uh, Dan O'Bannon. Yes, sir. That, that was one that, uh, to this day, uh, it was like a, a Rosetta Stone for me because it's all in there. And uh, I, I, I had been, I was a fan of Giro uh, years before it came out from... Uh, Lieutenant Blueberry, and uh, I'd heard that uh, he, had, he had a pseudonym for his science fiction work. And uh, I, I, you know, I when I first saw, I think I don't know what story I saw first, but I wasn't quite sold. I got well, I really liked the western, and uh, uh, but then I was at uh, one of those Phil Suling New York uh, Comic Cons, and they had a guy that was selling. Uh, um, of foreign material and he had some Miller Herlants and it had in there uh one of the Arzac ones it's the one of the ones with the uh the great one with the ape on top of the the monoliths and uh I was like oh my god yeah I'm an idiot and uh from then you know it was I, I tried to get my hands in every one I could which wasn't too well there was a French bookstore in Chicago and I could go there and they got they got uh Metal Herlant in there every month you know, uh, in the comments, very often, uh, whenever we take a look at your work, and I myself am victim of this, I assume that you were a Frenchman, a European fella, uh, because of your association, because of the work you've done over there. Did you learn French uh, through immersion, or did you uh, study it before heading over to uh, France? Uh, it was a little bit of both. I mean, I, I had taken French in high school, and... Uh, barely passed it and uh, I was kind of a troublemaker and I remember that it was a Catholic school and the nun, uh, the sister Mary Jean Marie who really disliked me to the point where because she would uh, I, I had allergies and I would I would I might, I'd sneeze I mean I could sneeze and sneeze and sneeze and sneeze and it'd go on and she just it just annoyed her and she'd say I mean, if you're gonna have to sneeze just leave and then come back which is great because I just, you know, even after the allergy season had passed, I was leaving. I just raised my hand up and I'd go out. So I, I had two years of it. And when it came for the third year, uh, and I barely passed each each year, she told them that if they let me back in the class that she would quit. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that meant the school or the, nun, or the sisterhood or what, but I thought, well, you know, for the benefit of the other kids who really want to learn French. I, so I didn't. But it was, you know, years later, it was because of my love of French comics that I took a, a semester at a, um, a community college in Los Angeles, which I failed, actually. <laughs> but I, I learned enough, you know, you learn enough of the structures that I could, because um, I was going over to France and I was going to go over there and I was going to visit with Mobius because I had met him uh, uh, previously on uh, when he was there working on Tron. And so I thought, well, I'm going to be in France. Like, I should, you know learn something. So I, I knew en enough, but it was really when I moved over there 
and my everyone was very patient with me and especially my my wife who uh, could speak english and speaks english very well she would always speak french with me and uh you know because a lot of times if you hear people kind of struggling you'll just go to their language to kind of get the conversation moving along but she is very patient to this day super patient and uh, that and watching i watched a lot of uh, television while i was working and they would run a lot of american shows dubbed into french and i knew the storylines so that kind of helped me to figure out their words i mean oh i remember this is what they were talking about and so but i mean i sounded like a caveman I'm sure <laughs> to this day probably but i, I didn't really care because well they understand me if it's like, you understand me you know i'm not you know i'm not I'm not trying to be Shakespearean here. I feel like one of the reasons why uh, we have to make sure we, we record with you is because we can find Jeff Darrow conversations on YouTube, but they're in French. And uh, we are stereotypical Americans here. We're monolingual. And I want to hear what you have to say. So checking out this uh, this Mobius comic, man, is, is a fantastic uh, excuse to have a fun conversation. Well, you know, before we start, I was, I was going to bring things. This is very, very odd. And uh, I just realized today, and we didn't plan this, that today is the day that Mobius died. Oh, my goodness. Rest in peace. Yeah, March the 10th. And uh, so it's just kind of funny that, because uh, when we, we talked about doing this, and I, I brought this story up, I, you know, it wasn't by any sort of choice by the you or me, but it was kind of a beautiful kind of the kind of thing I think would would please him. Yeah, we, it's we'll, a good coincidence. Ce we'll celebrate the man. Absolutely. Yeah. With with that in mind, uh, Jeff, you mentioned you know like tracking this down after you had become a fan of his through Blueberry. How did you find Blueberry? How did that like you know how did Mobius first cross your path? Well, he first crossed my path through, there was a, a book by Maurice Horn called a Comics Around the World or The World of Comics. It was kind of an encyclopedia of, uh, of, of comics around the world. Uh, and it was a great book, and I found it when I was in high school. And uh, it had like a chapter, of course, on America. Then it went to like, you know, France, and it went to Italy, and it went to Spain, and it went, it went to Japan. And there are all these guys in there. One of the guys was in there that struck me was this guy that did this Western called uh, Fort Navajo, The Adventures of Lieutenant Blueberry. And I thought, you know, wow, this guy looks really, you know. And um, I, I'd also that started, the comics fandom had sort of started manifesting itself. And I found uh, a thing called the, like the Buyer's Guide. It was smaller. And, and in it, there were ads for... Um, you know, back issue comics. And there's this guy in Grass Valley, Bud Plant, who had a catalog and I sent for it. And in it, he had European comics. He had the albums. And uh, he had Blueberry. And, uh, you know, and they were, I don't know, like two or three dollars. I don't know, which was a lot of money for me, for me then. But still, you know, and I sent away from him. And I still have the, the first one. Uh, if you want to see it, I'd show it to you, but I don't know if you're interested. But it, 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 and I sent for it, and uh, I just couldn't believe that anybody could draw like that. Jeff, was it published by like Dargo or big publisher? Yeah, it, like was, that? it was Dargo, and they had the rights to it for the longest time. And it's it's it switched hands a couple times. The interesting thing about rights over there is you can you own the character, and if you want to go somewhere else, you can. But the books will stay with the individual publisher, which is why. Except for, I think, Asterix. I think he won in that lawsuit. He got all his books back because they they really did something stupid with that guy. And they lost the lawsuit. And they lost the, the biggest cash cow in, 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 in the comics outside of Japan and uh, the world. I think those things sell so many copies. It's an interesting phenomenon how, how copyright law works with a lot of that stuff. Because I know, in, I think it's br the UK, whenever they have like the... Uh, what do you call it, 007, the James Bond books. It's like, uh -huh. here are the Ian Flemings, but the other ones have to be kind of like, where it, 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 there's no ghost writers or something. There's some, some extra technicality there. So the... Well, yeah, I'd always say something like Ian Fleming, and then below it'll be, uh, you'll have the name of I don't know, whoever they... I think the first one was a guy, God, it was called Colonel Sun. <laughs> written by, God, I don't know, a guy that was fairly well known in it. I can't think of his name. Yeah. It wasn't very good. I... 
You said you saw this original? Yeah, yeah. That that original was uh, hanging in uh, Joe Dworsky's uh, house. Um, because that was his idea. He told me he'd given that idea to Jean. And, uh, and Jean drew it. And so Jean gave him that drawing as a, uh, as a gift. And it was, yeah, the color was right. Uh, it was colored... I think they used. I think he used dyes because I know when I'd see him color stuff, and then he would he would use dyes, and it was direct color on the on the artwork. But I think all of them were done that way because I think that's maybe one of the only ones I ever saw. Because I think they he sold them off or gave them away. He was very, you know, uh, generous. And How large was the original for this? Gosh, it wasn't as big as I would have thought. It was. Uh, maybe like that i don't know maybe not even not even 11 by 17 i don't think maybe that's so bizarre to think of it's such an illusion of like how detailed his work is and to think that he's doing that at smaller sizes than we're used to is he, could, he would just magic I, I think i think he i don't know if he would if he use rapidographs or what or quotables or what he used on it but i know that um i was when I moved over there, he he, he had started this company called Edena, and uh, they had a little what they call a local. It was their office, which was just like a couple of rooms in the, in the courtyard of this this kind of rundown building. And uh, there was like a looked like a, a, a gym locker, and in this gym locker it was like all his originals. Mm. And I was like, oh my god! I said, if, if anybody knew where this stuff was. It just, I mean, it, it was literally like stacks. I mean, like, like, I don't know, like a, a yard high of just blueberry and all this stuff. And, and there were, but they had like mixed in there. There were some uh, um, Xerox copies of, of stuff and they were cleaning it out one day, his, his wife at the time and them. And someone threw something, they picked it up off the floor and it was a page of uh, Major Fetal, the Airtight Garage. And, uh, and and they thought it was a Xerox, but it wasn't. It wasn't originally. If you turned it and looked at the paper, you could see the ink was above the paper line, but it was so clean. There's like no pencil on it, and it's just. It was just. I, I think he probably just sat down and drew it straight, and they were they almost threw it away. <laughs> wow, Jeff, I want to thank you for for the original. <laughs> Eight by ten. Eight by ten. Uh, Jesus. Uh, sheet of paper. That was a typing paper, I think. <laughs> That's why they thought it was a fake. The original that you sent us of, of that Red Room cover, I mean, there's not one piece of white out on that. Like, that thing is so precise. I think I must have a little OCD. I, it, it bugged me. Like, I'd start over. Because uh, I just, I never used white out. I just, because I would see it. And it just looks weird to me. And anybody else's, I love to see it. I go, wow, that's cool. And even Mobius, I've seen him. But like some Mobius, will do, he'll cut stuff out and, and paste it over. And uh, but but I just God, it makes me crazy. And I just you know going now now I, I get I've got like a razor blade and I go in there and I'll scrape off the ink. And Cartoonist Kayfabe is sponsored by us and the comics that we make. So please support our latest comics. The best way to support this channel. Starting with my next book, Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness. These will be in your stores in March and in April, respectively. These are the main covers here. Retelling the history of the Incredible Hulk. Uh, 500 plus issues, 10,000 plus pages retold in two oversized issues with some really great variant covers to choose from, including Ed Piscors, Marcos Martin, Peach Momoko, and whenever we get into the Hulk Grand Design Madness, Jeff Darrow... Ed McGinnis. So let your co comic shop know you want these, and uh, it's March, Ed. These are going to be out in stores any minute now, so start picking those up. Speaking of, available now, new season of Red Room by Ed Piscor, Trigger Warnings. Red Room Antisocial Network, the collection, both of these are now available in comic shops all over the world. This is the main cover for Trigger Warnings starting the uh, 2022 season of Red Room. Uh, if you like violence and, and depravity, we're about to up the level of that and uh, start looking for Red Room Trigger Warnings number two. This is the cover to uh, to seek out. That'll be coming to your local store in April. You can also pick up our back catalog from Ed Piscor, WYSIWYG, Hip Hop, Family Tree, 
four deluxe oversized volumes available as well as box sets telling the history of hip hop. The book that started the Grand Design Craze, X-Men Grand Design by Ed Piscor. Three oversized, treasury size edition volumes available telling the complete history of the X-Men. And my books that are still available in print everywhere books and comics are sold. The Plain Janes, the first young adult graphic novel here in America. And Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. What do you say, Jimmy? Should we, should we uh, launch into things? Yeah, let's dig in. And for anybody at home, this is a July 1977 issue of Heavy Metal. And uh, we're just going to go straight to The Long Tomorrow. Yeah, let's do that. And, and you know, we should say that uh, if you haven't, man, you have to go out and see uh, Jodorowsky's Dune as uh, if you are a creative person. Uh, because this comic by Dan O'Bannon and with art by Mobius is kind of... Uh, uh, consequence of the union of all these creatives that Jodorowsky put together in order to try to make his version of you know Frank Herbert's Dune into a feature film and the documentary is important because the movie clearly is not successful it did not happen and but as a result of all these people getting together you get movies like Alien uh, written by Dan O'Bannon directed by Dan O'Bannon with with uh, designs by Mobius and H.R. Geiger and uh, also, uh, Chris Voss. Chris Voss. Is he this uh, spaceship guy? Yeah. Yeah. And and we have this piece here, um, the Long Tomorrow. Do you, Jeff? Do you know the genesis of this? Was it always supposed to be a comic? Is this a treatment for? Well, no, no. I, I, the writer's stand was that he was Dan O'Bannon was driving everybody crazy where they're trying to put this, you know, trying to put. Um, it was yeah. It was no. It, it was on. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was driving people crazy while they were working on the film, working on this Dune thing. And uh, he said, why don't you write me a comic strip? You know, and I'll draw it just to just to get him out of what they said, just get him out of his hair so that they would they'd be left alone. And, uh, and he wrote this script and then uh, and Jean drew it. And did he do rough drawings, Dan o O'Bannon? Did he do? Uh, I, I, I I do not think so. Okay. You know, I think it was just a script because, I mean, I wasn't there. I couldn't see, but because that stuff is pure Jean. I mean, if you see his, uh, yeah, I, I, I sincerely doubt it, but I could be wrong. Looking at this artwork, first off, so many cl very clean lines that look, you know, they're like a pen. You know, we speculate it could, could be dip pen, could be rip, like a rapidograph type thing, micron fine liner or something. Uh, Jeff, do you know if, would Mobius um, eyeball this perspective or would he grid things out first and then go in and I, draw? I don't think he did it like as much as I did, but I think he got a little bit. He had, he had a little bit of it, yeah. Because I've seen some of it. I've seen some lines on it, but I, you know, I can't say for sure. But I'm pretty sure because I mean, it's just so dead on. I can't believe it, you know. But guys, a genius, quite possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and perspective is such an important part. Like it's, it'd be. <laughs> that, that shot I hope that he didn't just fake this. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> Talk about no hope for the rest of us. Right. Yeah, I'm just going. I'm going home. You know. I, <laughs> Um, one of the big influential stories, you know, we start out and it's it's going to the private eye's office. Um, you know, one of the staples of of uh, cyberpunk is having that kind of noir detective element, and that's in place here right from the get go. Well, it's Raymond Chandler. I mean, I think it's that's pretty much what it was supposed to be—a a kind of a Philip Marlowe story. And, and as far as I'm concerned, this long tomorrow thing, it's basically Blade Runner. Because I know, I'm sure that because all that you like in Blade Runner, it's all in this comic, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's and Ridley Scott. If you've ever seen some of his older boards, he, you know, he would draw stuff that was very uh, Mobius inspired. And uh, you know, it's yeah. And speaking of the perspective, you know, we go from kind of getting into this incredible cityscape to this almost a splash page of that yeah. cityscape is now background is, is uh club is, is driving off to meet a potential client, but just this background, like God. you could spend yeah. a day staring at that and let alone trying to draw it. Well, any of even the panel, the, the panel at the, at the top, you know, he's in his office, like, gee, there's cripes. I think you can see out the window or, <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, ah, oh, man, I mean, it's so rich. And, uh, 
I think the color in this in, in the heavy metal is a little faded you know, from you know the, the original printings of it. But uh, my God, I mean, you see even you know you see the, the influence it had on the Fifth Element. I mean, it was well Jean worked on it along with his uh, art school uh, longtime friend uh, Jean Claude Mézière, who passed away just about two months ago. But uh, yeah. The, the color is just, remarkable too. Just like uh, you, you know, we always talk about uh, no blue skies. Uh, these these buildings could have been a slate gray color if it was some Marvel DC image kind of comic. Probably would have been treated in that way. Uh, who would think to color that stuff lime green? Right. Yeah. And I wonder how much Mobius is responsible for like breaking down and pacing the story because we end with uh, Club meeting his client. It's like a perfect page one amount of story where it's like, all right, we introduce our detective and now we introduce the client. Um, that's that's great. That's what you want for you know a page end. I feel like that sets a scene. Yeah, I gotta you know once again because <laughs> I'm prejudiced, but I gotta believe it's him. I think he was just given a, a, I don't know how, how complete a script he was given to do this, but I can't believe that it was, you know, um, especially since I, I've found that s uh, screenwriters don't write great, maybe it's changed out of uh, comic book scripts because they don't, they think of comics as being movies and, and they think since it's moving, for instance, they'll, they'll write a panel where it's like, uh, the detective comes into the room, goes to the filing cabinet, pulls out a folder, uh, throws a throws a, a beer can out the window, and then sits down in his chair. Panel one. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like a time lapse thing in there. You have the figure at the beginning. You know, the, the, a little DeLuca effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jeff, you have the original uh, appearance of uh, the Long tom Tomorrow at hand, right? In in your yeah. metal yeah. or long. Uh, yeah. Did Mobius letter the the title oh. treatment in english oh, yeah that's that's uh yeah yeah he did so it's the same deal yeah. yeah yeah here we go super cool man yeah because he could speak he could speak english you know, pretty well because when i first met him we were we, we spoke in english because i hadn't i had enough french and and he was there working on tron but uh i think later on he said that i was like the only the only American that bothered that he knew that bothered to learn French. Mm -hmm. so I think that kind of, but anyway, not that I speak it that well, as I've been told. I mean, looking at these voluminous little cityscapes, Jeff Darrow comes to mind when I oh, look yeah, at that, this right there. Oh God, that panel! I swear to God, I look at it so much because you know he's got the you know I mean who draws fucking neon? I've never seen neon drawn in a comic book before, for God's sake. I mean, it's such, it's, it, that is Blade Runner. That's the city. And, uh, God, and that, you know, just the, I don't know what you call it, that walking on the, the, the horizon line thing. I don't, it just, it, to me, I, mean, I saw it. I just couldn't believe it. This is an interesting one because often he would have people like on the horizon line. This is another one where the feet are yeah, on yeah. the horizon line. But if you look, it's different because the, the vanishing point is like a little bit lower. You see these these oh, things in the background. Have to be, you would have to, and that if it was absolutely accurate. I think you would have to have they'd have to be cut off a little bit at the feet, and like almost at the ankle, and they would be descending, yeah. which they do as they get closer. But you still see enough of the figure that they all seem to be standing on a line. Which, in terms of perspective, you can play with it. It doesn't have to be. It's not always a uh, you know an iron class clad rule. You can, and he played with it. And it's still, God, you know, it looks absolutely perfect to me. Also, the little noodling, you know, like the graffiti and things that are on the background always stands out. Even like the rotting pipes and, you know, liquid coming out around the pipes. Feels like uh, when we talk about cyberpunk, you know, that's the quality, right? It's an old world, even though it's a futuristic world. It's lived in. Yeah. 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 And it's something that you can identify with. It's not, you know... Uh, the sterile, almost like a THX 1138 world, or, or even, or you know, 2001 when you're inside the, the spacecraft, which is a whole, you know, it's, it's I'm putting that stuff down. But my God, for me, it's like, wow, you can identify with it. I mean, you could, you could I'm, actually think you could live. I mean, it's like, for me, it was like being in Tokyo. When I went to Tokyo, I go, 
wow, I'm in, I'm in the long tomorrow. <laughs> have that stuff. And I mean, my takeaway, because a lot of people, they would take away from Mobius is these little noodly lines that he would do. These little, which I always kind of thought he might have gotten from Robert Crumb, because it reminded me much of Crumb. But what I got from him was just the attention to detail and putting little things in that would create a world. Because his backgrounds are like a major character in all his comics. And I, I really appreciate that. There's no other world like that before he did that that I'd ever seen. I really wonder what kind of like basic reference he would have set up for himself in order to yeah. construct this stuff because some of it feels organic or like things that we've experienced, but he's clearly doing his own thing. Yeah, I think he, he was just very observational. And I mean, I know he had like, because I'd go over there and he'd have certain books that I would have, like old movie books, and he'd be like copying, you know, like stills from. One time he was over there, the last, the last time I saw him, he was like copying a still from a book that was an old movie series. And it was of the original black and white 1930s Perry Mason movies that starred a guy called Warren Williams. And he's drawn this scene out of the book. And it's got, you know, the main Perry Mason kind of doing the old, like, you were there that night. You're the killer. And the guy's shaking his head. But the, the client on, the, on the, the the witness stand is like some sort of weird alien demon thing. <laughs> so I don't know what it was about. <laughs> and he was just doing it. It was like, fuck, man. Jesus. <laughs> and everything else was so normal. And no one's reacting. They don't seem to be reacting to the fact that there's this demon on the witness stand. They're reacting to the fact that the demon's breaking down into this cross-examination. That was brilliant. Funny. Seeing just a general design, you could see how Hollywood would come a call in to try to get this guy to vi to realize like all of their, you know, ho hopeful scripts and stuff. Like just even the design on this hair, the way the lighting is situated, like yeah. it feels like this like solid mass, like a little helmet, you know, and well, it she, just it just looks cool. And she's almost got that Princess Leia thing, except they're not on the side of her head, right. but they're the cinnamon rolls are sticking out on the side <laughs> of her head. A little, a little Chinese, Japanese too, but I, I think that, you know, because of this, this is why he got involved in Alien because Ridley Scott called him up, and because uh, I, I don't know necessarily that, that, you know, when he worked on Dune, that that led to other movie work. It was, you know, working on Alien, and uh, and that was I think Ridley Scott that brought brought him into it. That's why, you know, I worked with Ridley Scott on a project, and uh, I, I was just, I said to him, I said, what, what do you want to what do you want me on this thing for? I said, you know, you just, you just call up Jean. He's the guy. But he's probably probably not available or too expensive. I don't know. But he goes, no, no, I want you. I think it's so cool how uh, you. I've never seen somebody do, do an outline of a shadow like that and sort of give themselves an indicator for color. And, and what's neat is you got this, you got that, that, because I always often because I know he liked Rolf and and that that pose of him kicking is there's one of that Rolf I've ever seen it, the Corbin story where he does that but it's like for me it's got everything in it like he's got you got this guy with four arms and you don't have to explain it at all uh, it's like where where the hell did this guy come from and he's got these you know lightsaber knives and he just kind of just you know, he takes this, you know, this Kung Fu pose and he, he just kicks him. Right? And it's so poetic and uh, almost like a ballet when he kicks him. And that's the end of that guy. And you got that sort of almost major fatal guy behind him like, oh, God. Fantastic. I mean, the little details like that. that it's like a little story, a right? little story, right? That one panel is a whole story. I love going from this kind of busy panel yeah. to having yeah. these quieter panels, but still super cool looking. You know, the yeah. forearms with, with your lightsaber daggers or switchblades almost and in their shapes. It is a good character piece right here, too. Like like you described, Jeff, the, the, the ballet kick, because this is effortless. Like, yeah. like this guy who looks, I mean, this is that classic uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark sequence yeah. that, that was done a million times where he's a badass motherfucker. And then you just dispatch him real quick. And then in the middle of you look like you look at he's got he's this is like a little bit of detail on his thumb on, on one of his he's got it's like he's 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 cut his thumb or something it's wrapped in bandages. <laughs> and, and like 
he does the cartoony thing where he's got the stars where he's kicked him in the crotch. Boing. It's, so it's 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 serious and it's like goofy at the same time. It's like how, how do you how how do you get away with that? How did he get away with that? You know, yeah. Jeff, like like there, your your work has bits uh, like that in there for sure, um, where there's like just other stuff going on and you add like little bits of personality. And we uh, were looking at that Miller Eisner book, and there was also a conversation Miller was in was in with uh, Klaus Jansen at School of Visual Arts. And when he brought up your work a couple of times, he used the word absurdist. Would you think that something like that would apply or? Uh, yeah. And, and my, and, and Jean's, I mean, I'm not in his head, but I, he just, you know, it, he thought it was funny. And, and uh, you know, it, it's funny because it's, it's, it's a kind of a typical you know Raymond Chandler kind of a story, but he's got these beats in it that are that you expect in a Chandler story, except that you know they're they're a little goofy. I mean, they're not you know like Jerry Lewis goofy, but you know there's just tiny little touches that you know you don't necessarily even notice when you're reading it. But uh, I know myself, I, I you know I just always think that what I'm drawing is so stupid that uh, I don't know why not. <laughs> I've become, I've started to associate that kind of uh, unusual details or little details with detective stories. And it started when we were like prepping for uh, Ed Brubaker and looking at like mysteries. But detective stories are different than like noir. You know, they're different than crime fiction. And they have that element, right? Because you're almost supposed to be looking at details. And so it rewards the reader if you have some of this kind of stuff, you know, because you're almost attuned to that as a, uh, you know, part of the genre is pay attention. Yeah. Look at the backgrounds. Look at what the character's wearing, you know. And that's kind of what you see with this. The other thing that I see on him is the physics. Oh, dude, even like the gestures and stuff. Like he, he's, he's like yeah. weighed into that seat there. That's a human. We've seen that pose, but absolutely just the... The You're absolutely right, Ed. And you see the way that the, the, the drapery falls on his. You see, like, his coat is hanging over his leg. I mean, it's just amazing. And then when you see where he's kicking him, look at look at the motion you get from the uh, his uh, trench coat uh, uh, flying up there. I mean, it's like, you know, there's no motion lines. I don't think so. I don't think. But uh, they're there in the, in the clothing. He uses the, the motion lines, the, the folds in the clothing to be the motion lines. And it's... Absolutely. Even the way if you look like his his left foot, it's planted in such a way so that it's carrying the weight. And uh, it's so funny. Before we called you, we were I, we were setting this up, and uh, Ed had a book here called Action Bible that I was going through, and it's it's references to different you know kicks and punches and throws and things, and that is what what I was noticing. Like you would see how the toes or how the foot's turned. Um, very believable elements in that case, anatomical. But I mean that that physics, that weight, the, uh, the the body language, like those are all elements that really separate comic book artists, in my opinion. Yeah. It's something, Jeff, that I admire in your work, uh, you know, because I see similar qualities of attention to weight and form, volume. Um, Kirby had that really well, where you'd see like yeah. a mass of a rock, and it felt like it was three dimensional yeah. and heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's almost impossible to explain what piece of the drawing communicates that. But when it's there, you see it. It's like that's the right line. You pick the right line. Th this guy feels like feels heavy, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. part of it is just you barely bring him off the ground. Just like such yeah. a little touch, like that left leg barely comes off the ground, and and just he feels anchored. Yeah. You get the sense that if this guy kicked that guy, like this guy would go flying a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and the things on his hat would be flopping around. <laughs> And you get the feeling too from that from that that guy that's like they've got you've got a whole idea of their their complicity because it's like he's like oh god here we go again All right he slaps himself and he goes, oh god he's such a, why do I work with this guy <laughs> yeah that's the detail these are not the most effective uh, leg breakers or whatever their role is <laughs> they're like those heavies in, in Scorsese's Cape Fear when they're like oh, we'll hire these dudes for a for a hospital job and then they go after Robert De Niro yes. and all get their asses clobbered. <laughs> Back to this wonderful perspective and depth. This is something I would see in like uh, like old films would do this, and I don't see it as much in newer movies. Maybe because we watch them on phones, but I specifically think of Citizen Kane and the shot of uh, you know looking through the window of the young boy in the beginning, 
while we're watching inside the house is like his uh, aunt and uncle, whoever his caretakers are, are letting him go. But it, it kind of has that effect to me of like, you can, it goes back, Jeff, to what you were saying about the screenwriter that has like three actions taking place in the panel. Mm-hmm. Hard to do, but occasionally you'll see solutions where it's like, okay, we've got two things happening, even though this is the same panel. You got the classic mulligan from the the uh, uh, Kiss Me Deadly, the suitcase that's in the suitcase. I wonder if that's what Dan O'Bannon was going for. Have you ever seen that Kiss Me Deadly? No. Oh, it's all about. There's like uh, it's a, directed by uh, uh, Robert Aldrich. Oh, it's, it was Ralph Meeker as Mike Hammer. And uh, it ends with they're all after the suitcase that they're not supposed to open. And uh, maybe maybe you'll see it. Maybe I should tell you. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't say because because but I it, absolutely I've seen can, it on if YouTube. You actually. It, if you can find it, you should watch it because it's just because he's like the creepiest uh, detective. He's not like you know like Frank Frank Miller's. You know his Sin City is very Mike Hammerish. But this detective in this one is like this transom peeper. He's really pretty a sleazy guy. And uh, but yeah, it's really worth checking out. The ending is just so surreal. I'm just picturing this is like where, where Mobius is keeping his original artwork. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it wasn't that nice, actually. But <laughs> Damn. He just didn't care. I remember one time he got this guy in Italy. They'd done this portfolio, him and Liberatore and his others. And this guy calls him and said, oh, I was in a payphone and I left the artwork in the uh, in the payphone and I've lost it, the originals. And uh, like Liberatore, you know, I wouldn't say what he said, but uh, but Morbius said, "No, oh, I'll just do another." He was like, "Oh, man. <laughs> he do another thing for the guy." Man, what a perspective that is. That would that would just ruin my day, my week, my mind. I couldn't do it. I was like, "No, I've done it once. I can't. I can't. I can't." It's so interesting you say that, Jeff, because like you sent us the pencils and the inks for that red room cover, and and it's like there's e- there might even be another stage. So it feels like like the work that you do is like done three times or two times at least. A pencil stage that's very very tight, and then an ink stage that's tighter. Yeah, I think so because I'm so insecure, and I want to, you know. I- because, I mean, in, in the very beginning, I have, in the other interview I said, is that when I said Hanna-Barbera, God, that guy that made me feel so bad about myself every day. I was like, oh, i got to draw this correct. i got to draw right. i got to get the wheels correct. i got to da 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 So I, I, I just try to, I want to leave nothing to chance, which is probably why, I don't know, I, 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 I guess people probably think my stuff is stiff and, uh, you know, stick up my butt looking kind of stuff but but i'm drawing i'm kind of drawing for me anyway trying to to make myself better it's interesting because like like your stuff like it's not stiff at all like the body language and things is incredible and i even i have to thank you for uh for correcting some of some of my pieces uh that that i was showing you off in, in stage and just seeing like the quick roughs like the like the um sketches of like what you had in mind like i already learned things about how to draw the wrist better and understand like the tendon right here and how it connects with the wrist and stuff just by seeing how your underdrawing works and seeing how you sort of see through the hand knuckles and things man it's 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 really cool what i'm saying is i wish i was a fly on the wall behind your head while 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 you uh, draw pages because i know it would make it better uh the only person that's ever been in the room with me when i'm drawing is my daughter because I'm so insecure, as I got kind of, people watching me, I just feel like that. I'd be like, a, "Is that okay? Is, is it okay?" Is it, <laughs> it, was hard, it was really hard when I because I had a like I said, but when I went to work on the Matrix, I hadn't worked with anybody in the room in you know twenty years, maybe yeah, twenty years since Hanna Barbera, and I was in the room with Steve Scrooge, and I just told everybody, the directors, everybody, you can't look at what I'm doing. Until I, <laughs> Until I say it's okay, otherwise I'm leaving. And they, uh, they, they did it, you know. Thinking about it, just because I thought I would stop. I thought if I got the least money, I'd stop. And I was like, I want to complete the thought. And, and I'm, just, I'm just thinking about that uh, that Tezuka documentary where it shows his workspace and how he's like, my wife yeah. is the only one who comes through this door. <laughs> Yeah, it's because my daughter would come in, she'd sit with me, and she had her, her, her board on the other side of my board, and we'd all watch, we'd watch the same kind of stupid TV stuff. 
and uh, you know, I'd sit there and draw, and she would draw. You know, my That's wife really cool, man. See me. I did a residency many years ago and it was with a bunch of other cartoonists and I'm I'm the same way like I draw in my room I don't I've never shared a studio and I remember it was I was so uptight about it at first and after I don't know an hour of everybody sitting there drawing it became like the coolest experience just because it's like a bunch of people doing what I'm doing I'm not some freak or <laughs> they're not doing I'm doing it like them we're all kind of you know you do it the same way I don't know it's very reassuring but kind of unnatural just because it's not something I, I did even yeah, in you're, school, you're, you would you're a cool guy, so. go draw at home and then come in and, you know, have your critique or whatever. But it wasn't like we were all sitting there watching each other draw for the most part. Once in a while, maybe in figure drawing classes. But yeah, back back to it. Interesting. I was looking at perspective and how, like, you know, we're seeing a kind of similar perspective here, maybe lowering your horizon line a little bit. Uh, it would have been awkward if, if this were converging in the same points. Um, and then, you know, you see him doing different stuff for perspective in these other panels, uh, not repeating this, you know, like varying that up the same way you'd vary up your compositions, because even this figure is kind of this, this basic perspective, but your lines are totally different. He's not a Dutch angle guy. It's all, it's all up and down. Yeah. It, except for like the money shot on that splash page where that hover car is doing its thing. Then you, then you get an interesting angle. He uses it for, for great effect. It's not just like how to draw comics the Marvel way where it's like, tilt every panel. <laughs> that looks ruthless. That looks so brutal. And it makes me remember uh, the... I forget what it was, an essay or something that Mobius did where he was like talking about the five things that are like extremely hard to draw. And one of them was like a character laying... Uh, a character laying down is like like the the weight is, is really hard to get correct. When the body's touching some surface, it'll flatten out a little bit, and and if you don't do it right, it looks like you know, like they're like an inch of air, but they're hovering over the top of the, the, the like she'd be hovering over the top of the bed, but she's laying there, and she's you know you can see her buttocks are you know, they're they're just drawn enough so that you know that there's some weight the weight from her, her pelvis from laying down. But it's going to bring something up that's kind of interesting as we're looking through this. I realized now in Metal Herlant, the layout is different in that that you see these those two pages um, together. And the way it was originally presented, you have to turn the page to uh. get to the. And there's a, a few things I got that I think you know. I, I'm, I'm curious. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Because you know, you know how it is. You, you like to have a page end a certain way, so you have to turn it and then. You can use that time, that time of turning of the page to have something happen, or like get them out of a building, or whatever. And I, I, I often wonder if, you know, because like this is the first page, and right. it's on the, the it's on the right hand side, so you can tell pretty much from that. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah, it's very odd to start a page on the left. I wonder how much control he had over that because we looked at um, Bill Sienkiewicz's Love and War graphic novel recently, and they've reprinted it so that the pages are different. And the way that book starts, the first page is a left-hand page, which is pretty yeah. unusual. And, uh, and, and Bill Sienkiewicz weighed in on our video, you know, commented uh -huh. and said that he wasn't really thinking about that, you know, the, the oh, way the spreads good. would line up. Um, and it kind of works either way, that book. Uh, but you can see how this would be your surprise, like a page turn. Yeah. This would be a really effective yeah. page turn, obviously. Because yeah. I, 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 know, I know that you guys do that. I, I think of it, you know, like, because like I say, it... it, it it gives you that that in between shot you can because you're giving the audience time to, you know. Yeah, it's a break. It's it's a time thing. It could be a, a jumping across scenes. Like there's a lot of ways that page turn can can work. But that's your separation most of the time. Like the spreads the unit. God, look at these designs on these cars. Even oh man, yeah, and and you know it's. That's people, you don't see that in American comics. You don't see like stuff in cars that, I mean, uh, some of it is time. You just don't see like, you know, it's like a car chase in there. And, you know, it's really quick, but it's super effective. And I mean, you know, I mean, the violence of it. I mean, you got the guy, that's, this is something, all the stuff that I realized, I look at this, I picked up from, from him. It's just like, you know, that guy that's gotten hit, his arm is flying off. And, <laughs> and it's all this sort of like collateral damage that, you know get in most comics it's like, i mean yeah it's it's funny i mean as many times as the hulk has smashed up uh, uh new york or wherever you'd think <laughs> nobody's there never no one ever 
never seems to hurt an orphanage, fortunately. <laughs> this coloring almost looks like markers. You know, some of the oh. some of the marks, you know, mm. in the hood and things. Yeah, yeah. You're right. But I, I, as I look at the one here, I, I got a feeling that it was dyes. Yeah. But it could be because it's some, it has that sort of that marker thing where it kind of, I don't know what you call it, kind of a, it absorbs more in one area than the other. And if you don't, you don't, because I mean, you know, you guys were, you did that thing on, on, on ranks of rocks and that's what he used. He used uh, mostly all, always markers. And uh, I think I, I mentioned this to you that he, he would blend them using his fingers to such a point that this fingerprints had been like almost rubbed off and, 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 Part in parts because he, he wasn't because he lived in a small village in Italy and it wasn't until he moved to Paris and somebody gave him an electric eraser and it changed his life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he would use those and God, you know, you can't. I mean, there's this weird stuff we just do to ourselves, man. Like my middle finger, where I sort of press m with my thumb against the pencil, uh, like my middle finger is so crooked at the tip. <laughs> Right. I, I don't even have the callus that a lot of people have. I'm hiding it now. I see you looking too close, Jeff. <laughs> uh, but like, I have this gnarly ass middle finger. Do you need to point something out with that? <laughs> just from like 15 hours a day pressing on it. It's like Chinese foot binding or corsetry or something. Yeah, you know, I I, I remember when they started talking about metacarp meta is it metacarpal tunnel syndrome, mm -hmm. and I kept that. Oh my god, that sounds like something that I would get because I draw so hard. And I'm knocking on wood. I don't know how I avoid it because I have so many people in animation that you know that wear those wrist things, and and uh, I, it's, to me, it's just yeah, because I'm such a brute. I mean, I have no finesse whatsoever. And, uh, I mean, I could see like a guy like you know Dave Stevens when he would ink. I mean, his stuff was just so. I mean, I could see there where there wouldn't be any, you know, because <laughs> it was like a feathered touch. It's I mean, like the brush barely touches the the uh the paper but it's that so. feather touch that'll do it man like dick giordano's the guy who's like you don't draw with your wrist like you draw with your shoulder so you just keep this like mm -hmm. stroke like that man and and just move it all from the shoulder piece it's a secret to ink and new atoms man these uh, uh these crowd scenes and car scenes remind me a lot of that uh opening in hard boiled <laughs> Whenever you're seeing like all the figures, you know, in that in that sex violence club that they crash into, just put a license oh. plate in his knee. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, this is really good storytelling. Great These color two treatment panels above each other. The the shooting and then the aftermath of uh, the shooting. Just muting it all out. Intense green sound effect. You see the color of the guy. Like that's that's beautiful that, that visual storytelling. Fantastic. You're right. You're. I think you're right, Jim. Like, that looks like something you'd get only from a marker. But it could be, you know, because it kind of looks. And this yeah. is um, this is our wrap for the first part. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind yeah. of your cliffhanger as somebody tries to kill, to kill Pete, and then takes off with him in hot pursuit. It's so funny to see, like you mentioned, the lettering. The lettering is all Mobius, and uh, at the end it's a sweeper, which means to be continued. But yeah. This thing, he's very cartoon because he takes off and he turns into like like an American guy. He's got this red, white, and blue, blue outfit. <laughs> it's Captain America from Easy Rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Almost, uh, almost doing some commentary there on the uh, the American action movies. Oh man, I didn't realize that this was a two page piece. Oh jeez, I didn't either. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. There it is. It would have been a crime to not have the entire landscape on the uh, on the vid there. Yeah, that thing is just, I mean, when you see it, and that thing was, I'm pretty sure it was done with dyes. Yeah, you could but. see absolute brush strokes and stuff. And, like, if it's stuff like the Doc Martin dyes, that yeah. is an incredible feat because those are such poppy, saturated yeah. colors. Um, yeah, he, he was good with that, although I remember watching him one time. Uh, he, was, he was supposed to do, like, a portfolio with cats, I think. But anyway, he's, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm talking to him. And, and you know he's just drawing this beautiful cat, and he's cut. He's gonna airbrush it, you know, a little airbrush, and he's, he dies in the in the airbrush. And he's <laughs> he's cutting out the frisket. You know how that works in the old days. You, you cut out, you block, you block out the. And so he's talking to me, and da da da. And we're going back and forth, <laughs> and he's cutting these other razor blades. And I'm watching him fascinated, and 
and he, and he, he removes the, you know, and he gets out of the airbrush and, <laughs> and he lifts it up and he's missed a spot. Oh. <laughs> now the cat's like, oh, he's like, oh. So he gets it and he adds another color to it. And it's like he cuts the thing out and, da, 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 and he adds a color to it. And it's, it looks really neat. He, he lifts up the bridge and he's missed another spot. <laughs> and at this point, I'm starting to feel guilty because I think maybe I'm distracting him so much that he's. So he, goes, oh. so he ends up turning this cat into like a rainbow. And it's a, like a beautiful mistake. And, uh, but yeah, it was all, it was Dr. Mines and the little, the little airbrush, a little cup. And, um, Joe Joe Kubert like one of his secrets with that because he he would he would do washes with dyes too and and once again just so saturated and ridiculous but the color like burnt sienna and like mm. uh, like a sepia color would be cut with everything uh, to cr- kind of create a little bit of this kind of muted sort yeah. of texture and it would be so diluted like the dyes are so high octane that like one drop to 30 drops water is like plenty because if you if you allow it to be saturated anyway like it just looks like easter i wonder if that's what you're getting in some of these reds Mm -hmm. because they look you know they look uh really really hot that that piece of artwork that that arzak that was stolen it doesn't have anything so Um, if anybody out there ever sees that thing somewhere yeah knock them out you guys let us know because i mean he was his yeah it's fucked up Jeff, you ever cross paths with Bernie Wrightson? Uh, only once, because uh, I was a huge fan of Bernie Wrightson. We all go through these, you know, and I, mean, I traded off my Fantastic Four number one for uh, this book they did on Bernie Wrightson called A Look Back. It was a very limited uh, edition. And it had like all the stuff, you know, stuff that he hadn't finished and things that I'd never seen anywhere. And I was such a fan of, oh, Oh, and I and I didn't have any money. I'd moved to LA, and they had like one copy of it. And it was just that you know, the, the book was like a hundred, hundred and some dollar, hundred and fifty dollars maybe. I think it was a very limited thing, like I said. And uh, but being as, as a comic store, they didn't just trade me one up. You know, here he is, it's Fantastic Four number one. I had to pay fifty dollars on top of it. <laughs> They knew they knew you wanted that rights in book. Yeah, they did. I mean, I had a goofy looking, you know, kid. That, but I wanted it, and uh, you know, I mean, I'm I, I don't feel bad about it because I, I got what I wanted. But I, the fifty dollars thing, that's pretty. That's you know, we put story. Up. Not all of them. Mm-hmm. Back then. All right. So moving back into Long Tomorrow Part Two. Here we go. And uh, last we saw. It's uh, Pete Club chasing this this guy who tried to take him out in the car, and catching up to him on the surface. This is really cool, you know. Like those those cities are all those levels, and uh, reminds me a little bit of Judge Dredd we've been looking at lately. But uh, the top surface that's where you're having like your launch vehicles, your rockets, and everything to uh, you know to go into presumably into space. And uh, that's a cool idea. Like you're thinking of this world as these levels, and this is like your outer shell. Build in that intense moon, and all the lighting is suggested based on that giant m- moonlight. All this double lighting. Yeah. You see it on on the figures everywhere. It's really cool yeah. looking. Such a great figure artist, man. Yeah. And he and he, I feel like he doesn't do it so much, but there's there's like really really good foreshortening, yep. like with that foot really close to the camera like that. Jeff, do you think oh. about lighting a lot in your drawing? Not at all. I, I you know, I gotta listen to you guys talking and I am I just, I'm just so concerned with just drawing something right. I go, ah, whatever. I, I mean, I, I'm probably afraid to do it. I, I, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I could see it being a slippery slope in a Jeff Darrow piece because because now you have to have lighting on every little piece of everything. Like, well, and I have to, and I have to cover things up. <laughs> you know, like I want, and I want to, I want to be able to draw the guy because I'm so concerned about. Wow, look, he actually is able to draw a Colt 45, as opposed to just have it in shadow and in which it, the way it should be. But I get so concerned with that stuff. It's like, well, yeah, but if I put lighting on it, then I'll cover up. You know the. The, the big pens that are in his pocket or the because of which I've already drawn or the you know the bullets on the bandolier on his belt or you know the, the, whatever I've drawn on the car or inside of the car and 
And I always think I'll mess it up anyway. So uh, always, the easiest thing for me to do is just to draw. It was probably lean you, Claire, because I just draw things and they just go in and thick and thin and, you know, and then let, let, let whoever's going to color it uh, figure it out. But I mean, I will say like, you know, like, I mean, I'll, I'll, all I ever did, I say the time of day. But I mean, I, I, when I started out, I was doing, you know, I was. When you draw a night, I, I guess when you draw a night scene, you just, you just leave it open and they have, say, okay. That's why I always leave the hair open. I never make it, I hardly ever make it. It's a mustache, I'll make it dark, but generally I leave it because then I can, you know, pick the hair if I want it to be green or blonde or red. I just did a panel on something and I actually, well, I'll do those silhouettes, but I actually did a panel that had some silhouettes in it, which I think I did. I haven't done since the big guy. There was one panel in Big Guy that had a helicopter, a helicopter window, with, totally in black, which is a silhouette. I think the only time I've ever had any kind of lighting in my comic. I considered whenever I did the, um, whenever I was coloring your Hulk Grand Design cover, uh, making the sky black, you know, so then like the figures would all be popped out. And uh, it looked pretty cool. I'll have to send that to you, the, uh, the, the, the mock up that I did like that. But. Um, you did a beautiful job. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't envy anybody. I mean, I always, you know, anybody. That, uh, I, I was never surprised when people would quit. <laughs> I mean, I had so many people quit on me right from the very beginning. Hard to find a good colorist. Hmm. Well, you know, and I think because they don't get, you know, uh, they get, don't get paid that much, and it, it's very you know, labor intensive because I got so much junk going on. Stewart definitely seems like he found a system to, to color your stuff, man. Like he 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 found he's found a way. Yeah, yeah. I think we you know since he doesn't have to do the flatting, I think that that is quite a bit. Because I mean, when it used to be on you know, the the blue line stuff, which was nightmarish. I mean, that was always you know the registration thing was always the scariest thing because yeah. you could never it never married absolutely to the image. You'd always get a little bit of. The, the outside the line, the color be outside the line. Like, you know. As a kid, I was always so, in my coloring books, I always stay inside the line. And I was concerned about that. So I'd, I'd see it in my own comments. Like, oh, they're outside the line. <laughs> it's always, funny because I bring that up because I've got this, uh, this is a, a, another f a collection of a lot of his stuff that if you look at Arzak and this story. And then one of the panels, it's very odd, the, uh, the line work disappears on one of the figures. It's very, I don't know if you can see it, but. Oh, yeah. His face, I, I don't know whether it was the, you know, the, because it must have been done on, on on blue line because it, it rubbed out. I don't know. It's very odd. But the rest of it's there. But. I'm always impressed when a guy like Mobius is able to do action stuff. Because I think of him as perspective in these like landscapes and stuff, but then whenever you see a fight going on, it looks great. You know the the figure work. Yeah, that's that's sort of not to be taken lightly. I've I've went down this rabbit hole of uh, the the nine old men from from Disney, and there's this documentary where it like goes into each of the artists and talks about their strengths. And like one of the artists, I'm, I'm not going to remember which dude, uh, but most animators avoided having characters touch. Because that's like a really hard thing to draw, the kind of physics of that. And he's the guy that like mastered the art of like characters hugging and embracing and shaking hands and stuff, which most people try to avoid a little bit. So I think that's a little bit about what like what, what you're talking about, just like the interaction of these figures and making it seem right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I always love this. This feels Corbin-ish right here. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. little bottom tier. What were you about to say, Jeff? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I was just going to say that you, when you have like, when somebody's getting punched and they're, they're flying away, it's not easier than when they're like they're grappling with each other and they got like you know like an arm around there because boy, that's just a pain in the ass because that's like there's all those things you have to consider and uh, yeah, I'll just have them uh, <laughs> flying ten feet away. But, yeah, it's uh, true, man. So like that piece right there, like that's he Mobius yeah. isn't doing himself any favors by cho choosing to draw that. That's a tough thing to yeah. draw and, and he pulled it off yeah yeah this is such a cool sequence too again like i i just wonder like how is this written 
who's interpret who, who's laying this out that it works so well but the idea of like he's going to give this guy a chance and he's just got to run away underneath a rocket that's about to take off <laughs> what a cool way to execute somebody <laughs> <laughs> even has to shoot him because the guy's like i can't what i can't do that it it, <laughs> it just feels like mobius like he could put himself in this world man you see yeah. the color play too like it's so restrained for what we're about to see all storytelling all storytelling I wonder, um, Jeff, do you know if these pages were, uh, if, if this is the way these pages were arranged? Because I could see I this gonna, being your page turn. I was just going to say that this is the way it was, it was printed in, the, in, in, in both the comic and in the book that I have. So that this, this, this is the correct uh, layout, yeah. And just look even at the color choices of, of the figures. There's no mistaking. You got to primary color guy you got a secondary color guy the green guy against the purples there you got the dude with like against that like pastel kind of granite complementary colors with the oranges and the purples in your background the yellows and the and the purples and we just need to get some green in there and before you turn the page there's one one thing on here that is really i want to point out Go to, on the top panel now you see him running. Yes. Now, to, now keep, keep your finger going and see that little robot there. That is the that is the probot from Star Wars. That absolutely is, no doubt. Yeah, and uh, I remember because uh, I know some people when it came out, I was like, "Holy shit, I've seen that before!" And I know people that were up there and they said, "Yeah, that they had taken this panel and they they blew it up and they copped it and put it in there," and uh, I. Tops did this whole Star Wars card uh, set, and they asked, you know, I, I was asked to do one, and I, and you were supposed to do the thing that you wanted to do, and then explain why you wanted to do it, and uh, I picked that scene with the the probot, and on the back I explained, you know, I thought this probot was a really cool design. It was a cool design when Mobius did it in the long tomorrow. <laughs> did they let that stay? I know, and they know they 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 axed it. You know. <laughs> Yeah, but I was like, God damn it! I was going to get him some justice. They even made a they made a really cool toy of it too, and I know that somebody like Jean, he he doesn't care about this. It was just, but you know, I just see like the people at Fox like, oh, no, 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 no. you know, <laughs> we don't want a lawsuit. Oh, man. But, yeah, but anyway, there you go. It's kind of neat when he does like the atmospheric perspective. You know, we were talking about grids and stuff. But here you see like that big complex apparatus up close. You can see rivets and pieces of metal. But here it is. Yeah. It's just like a reverse silhouette or an outline of the you know the, the shape of that. It's kind of and neat. there's that classic NASA shot of you know the, the, that have the camera on the outside of the, the the rocket and you'd see the you know looking down the, the rocket. All the ice and gimmicks falling off. Yeah, a little bits of. <laughs> We're about to get sexy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can imagine he enjoyed this sequence. Yeah cracking open our suitcase to see what's inside and it is indeed the major's brain <laughs> our, our MacGuffin is revealed it's so funny a brain in a box it's a genius they're abandoned that, that, that's that's just fantastic that feels like such a classic uh sci-fi trope kind of uh detail right yeah more color of storytelling man they got that beautiful pink with all this muted green around it like uh you fuzz your eyes out like you're you're seeing all the main stuff that that Mobius wants you to 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 see as the predominant image. Yeah, no doubt. And I always make a big deal about like what's in the middle of your page, you know. And in this case, it is this brain. Jeff, do you think about page like the overall page compositions when you're putting your pages together like that? <laughs> Once again, <laughs> I love what you because you guys do, and I when I when I hear you talk about it, I feel so guilty. I don't at all. I just think about this panel and this panel. This has to do just this leads into this, and I have to show this so that you'll understand that. I, not at all. And it probably shows. I mean, so ever since I've been listening to you guys, I'll look at it and I go, yeah, this probably looks pretty confusing. But I see things like one at a time, and which is probably a lot of my stuff. Is yeah, you, you know what it is? Like, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for you, but there's you at the very very least like I just had, it's all internalized like you have like a perfect intuition for for storytelling because your stuff is always super it's always mm -hmm. super clear like you might have a lot of things going on and a lot of um drawing on a page but 
the reader never gets confused. Uh, a lot of it has to do with like your choice of line weight with the important like main figures and 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 that sort of stuff. But uh, the stories always flow. It's nice you to say. I always were concerned that I don't put enough you know space between the panels. Those are, I told you, you can't start talking about nine panel grid and all that stuff and eight panels. I go, geez, I never. I've heard that stuff, but I've never thought about it. Probably feel like little listen to Dave Gibbons because I mean you know the guy's a genius and he's you know uh, I was like wow and he's a pro I just feel like I'm like I'm still a fan guy <laughs> it's just like I got really lucky and, uh, and I guess you know, I guess it kind of makes sense but I, you know, there, but. I do think a lot of that's intuitive though you know like we sit here and talk this way but when I'm making comics it doesn't I'm lucky if it works out where I go oh yeah that's the that story just falls that I get to do a cool centerpiece. You know, it's not like every page. And even when we're looking at stuff, um, it almost, we mention it because it stands out. You know, you look over here and you don't have anything like that. So I feel like a lot of the storytelling is intuitive. And then whenever you go back and you read it and you reread it, you start to pull things out, whether to talk, you know, to each other about or because it just, it just hits you, you know, and you think like, wow, that really works. Uh, why does it work? You know, how did they do it? It's a lot of reverse engineering whenever... Yeah. 30 or 40 well, years later whenever we're looking at this stuff and and trying to figure out like why is this magic i'm just looking at this gesture of him like got it's the so chick ride and and he's and he's stretching to go get pick up the phone and it it's so believable and he's tweaking her nipple and he's like oh my god i look like kind of like <laughs> it covers up it covers up the phone the classic uh no but my god uh, uh <laughs> but that top panel i swear to god God, I look at that so much. There's so much detail in that. You just about the guy. I mean, God, it's fantastic. I mean, you got look at the drapery, the bed, the perspective. He's got like that little tiny, little tiny, like, tiny piece of artwork on the wall. <laughs> I'd never do that. It's like wow, and it's Mickey Mouse on top of it. You look at it. And, wow. wow, that chair with the. You know, they've thrown the clothes over the top of it. All that little bit of detail that, you know, and he's got the dishes and the and the sink in the back there. It's like, and and it never gets in the way. You don't you know you don't have to look at it if you don't want to. I was felt the same way about it. It's there if you want to see it, but it, you know, you kind of take it all in, and it just, it's like a, it's a world there. It is, man, and and it really is casting. It's a character piece. Like yeah. you see that stuff and you can infer the person who lives in that, in that space. You know, once again, going back to that Eisner Miller conversation book that we, that we were checking out, man, I, Eisner talks about a part where all you need is the corner of a table, a Tiffany lamp and a doily. <laughs> and it's probably not some, there, there's probably not a schmuck who lives there who wears his baseball cap backwards. <laughs> and then Frank Miller chimes in, unless he broke in. <laughs> I was thinking back of those those Nick Furies that Stranko would do, and they'd be in his apartment. And the way, the way Jim Stranko would draw the guy, like a, the, the, all these statues and all this, like Nick Fury was, I guess, an art collector and a, <laughs> uh, and a fancy chair. And the, it's like, wow. It was like, I think that that was like Jim's idea of how like a bachelor spy would live. <laughs> Whereas in the Mobius thing, Hey, he's got a refrigerator with junk on it and a photo of Mickey Mouse in, in one chair. Yeah, it's the a guy's it, a bachelor. It's that bachelor thing, man. I I had I had one spoon and one fork for many years, man. <laughs> one 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 plate, one one uh, soup uh, bowl, and uh, one glass, and you just wash them every every time. Yeah. And truthfully, I just had uh, three of uh, those things, just in case. And then everybody's worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah, man. Talk about a page turn. Things go wrong in this page turn. We're going Lovecraftian, yeah. psychosexualis, oh. man. Yeah, and, and the thing, and uh, and God, I mean, we're, we're going to jump around here, but the the little bit with his, <laughs> the thing still got a hold of his dick. <laughs> he's still he's still coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the little spurts. <laughs> I can just see Jean like just like yeah, well, yeah, but still, you know, it's textured for his comfort. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a European touch. And and like oh with the tensility of the tentacles, it really looks like 
he's like, oh, fuck, get this off. Like, really pushing it off of him as not far as yet. that stretch. Not quite, not, not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then when it's just finishing like, the job. God, he's really, I mean, yeah, he's really doing a... I just, no, at first I thought there was just one spur, but there's quite a bit there. <laughs> Yeah, he's a fertile fellow, man. <laughs> and did they translate the? Uh, oh, my love, yeah, yeah. Can, because in the French version, the lettering is there's no balloon; it's just right over the top of the the drawing, which is I think is a lot nicer. But I can understand why they why they want to touch his drawing. So That's, we we mentioned that kick with that big uh, doofus in the first round. There you go, yeah. Now, yeah. it was elegant. You described it as ballet. All bets are off when you have a Cthulhu head fucking wrapped around your dingus because it's the same pose and stuff, but it's a little less elegant in terms of what this character is doing, but it's a very beautiful drawing. But and he's still, got, he's still got a boner. I mean, he's got a boner right up to the end. <laughs> or it goes limp in the, yeah, on the next page, finally. Yeah, and the thing splats against the wall. He's hit flattened out against the... Uh, Actually, that's funny. Uh, now that I'm looking at it, it uh, they they cropped that last panel one where he's kicking it in the uh, in the uh, you know, maybe you can tell other direction. There it is. Hmm. See, you can see it's like there's a painting there. It's hidden. Oh yeah, that it makes me mad. Wonder yeah. why they crop. It's weird because because the rest of it's the rest of it's all there. That's odd. Yeah, did did they add um, did they add some bits on this side I'm of the panel? I'm looking to see because all the other panels are as they were. That's the only one that's been messed with. Weird. Yeah, it got like zoomed in or something. Is there some sort of copy written closer up on the Mickey Mouse around the bottom or something of that panel? Because it's like ours is zoomed in. No, no. Yeah, real weird choice. Yeah, it's so inexplicable. It's yeah. It's, there, there's something written below, written below the painting that's to the right of that creature when it hits the wall, but uh, I can't read it. It's so because of the the reproduction, the letters. It kind of, Love the storytelling of how how splatted against the wall, and then like one last ditch <laughs> effort, like to materialize into something that he doesn't want to kill. Yes, right. <laughs> He's got, he turns his back on this thing on top of it. Come on, man. I'd, I'd be loading that gun with my, you know, like my eyes <laughs> dead on that thing. He's like, nah, I've got this thing covered. You know, I've got my, I've got the gun between my legs and the gun in my hand. You know, which one's more dangerous, baby? <laughs> Jeepers, Christ. Jeff, do you get nervous about like white space? on on the page because i'm looking at like the back muscles right of of our main guy here and one could draw stuff this is a perfect drawing but there would be a lot of white space there and i would wonder if the impulse would be to just start to noodle find opportunity to put stuff there yeah but for me it would would probably be like put like a tattoo or something but I, i he's got all the lines you need there to describe the back and such and the I love the little the uh, on, on his uh, glute on his butt. You see that little concave line there where the hip would be uh, you know, on, on the second panel. Yeah, and he's got but, those Venus dimples. Yeah, the little yeah. thumbprint holders. Yeah, yeah. but no, I, yeah, I'm off. Gosh, I'm, like, I said one time, I think that Mike Kaluta said to me once, "I've got two words for you, Jeff: negative space." <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is. Uh, by creating like doing the work that you do at the volume that you do like on each image that stuff becomes negative space like like it still could be a populated city but that's not the main focus and by having that it, it's almost like it's a kind of a gray when you have this like main figure that has the thicker bolder lines and stuff it's a real interesting choice you know you always see things like you know i draw those complicated things in the sea i always think i don't know because i look New York, you look at Times Square, it just looks complicated. You, know, you, you, you can focus on one thing, but there's just so much going on. And I don't know, maybe you shouldn't do that in a comic book. I think it's interesting, the different drawing between these two pages. Yeah. 
Because I remember one of my first Mobius encounters was the Silver Surfer yeah. Mobius book. It's just what mm -hmm. I had access to. But in the back, they talked, uh, you know, like Mobius has some some text in there. And he talks about like his pens wearing down. And then they get heavier lines and, and stuff. And I would go back through that that Surfer book, you know, and try to see that progression. And it almost feels like if I were guessing, we're switching pen nibs. Right. You know, like this is a new pen nib coming in. Or maybe he's working on something and, and got pulled away from this. And now he comes back. You know, a couple it's, of days later. It's quite possible because he was always, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Jean, uh, Jean-Michel Charlier wrote Blueberry. Blueberry was a successful series. And uh, maybe I've told you this before, but uh, he, when Jean started doing these sort of stories, uh, he did not like it, uh, Charlier, because he said it's detracts from you should just be, why aren't you just doing Blueberry? He's always be late. It's quite possible that you know he's jumping off, you know, blueberry to uh, to do this, and he it bothered him so much that he says you're going to hurt the, the the brand, the blueberry brand with these crazy kind of. I, I think he thought he was probably doing drugs or something, and uh, so he adopted this pseudonym of Mobius, so that so people a lot of people didn't know that that were they were the same guys over there, and uh, so that's why he adopted Mobius to. Uh, so that Charlier would, you know, <laughs> Blueberry was protected. So that's quite possible. You're right, Jim. That sounds like a, it's quite possible that he jumped off on something else and then came back. But the spacing between her eyes is always, I was like, it's really, really brave. Because it's like, wow. Because I mean, I'd want to, I'd want to go in there and, and, and put like a, just a little bit of a line of the, of the nose, to, you know, at the top. And he's just, he just leaves it out there. That looks like something that Frank Whiteley would that's internalize. That's exactly what I was going yeah. to say. yeah. You're right. You're absolutely right, people. Yeah. Yeah, he did a uh, like a vampire covers for this Vertigo series, and I swear, oh. like you can see this face in in some of those characters. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, because it's a little like the darkening around the eyes. It's really brave stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and that is like uh, what's left after you eat a chicken or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a mess. <laughs> I love that he's just well. He's, I love that the. the, the He's pulling up his zipper. He's not like putting on his shirt. He's pulling up his zipper. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. The, the, the coital relationship has consummated. Yep. Once case, case, case closed. <laughs> no and just that bend forward with the figure too. You know, it's, it's yeah. that awkward, like, he yeah. still looks balanced. Yes. But he is bent forward. It's so subtle. It is. I think that's that's a key word with with his figure drawing. Like he captures a subtlety that people who, you know, try to draw like him or whatever, they just they they can't get it. And you get that like the legs, you got the planning of the feet. And he just shows enough of that and the and the you know, the the leg that's hidden by the other leg, just enough of it. Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, wow. He never he never he always knows when to, to add something and, and and not and not just let it go because you know somebody he could have just had a little bit of the foot sticking out you know out behind the other one but he put that in there and it's like like I feel like we take this for granted because we we just been around for a while and and, draw, and drawn a bunch um, do you remember how hard it was when you were young to draw a figure in perspective like this with the leg rooted and to like know that you have to draw this smaller leg behind it it's like oh, oh, it just it feels it feels like you're doing something wrong but then yeah. when you see it in drawings it's it feels right but it never felt right to do it's like legs are the same size i can remember looking at comics where somebody would do it right and, I, and just loving it and yeah. almost not being able to understand like why is that good or what am i doing wrong and that's what it was uh -huh. it was getting that like perspective uh, on the human figure it's one of those things that you learn like you don't know you need to know that and until until you are in, in the midst of putting a drawing together and then you're like this other foot is going through the stairs if i draw it the same size and that and that drawing is such a great drawing for anybody that's listening that is, had, is having trouble with perspective because it's so simple and because everything is kind of boxish in a way and, and if and if you study it and, try, and maybe even copy it and figure out you know draw see where his vanishing points are going where is where his horizon line, he said it, 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 and it just makes drawing all the other stuff easy because you know 
like the lamp, if you can see the, a little bit of the lamp, the underside of it, the top of it. And it's just, all this is just a, such an amazing study in, in form and perspective and uh, imagination. It just, it's all there. Everything that is Mobius for me is in, is in this, this story. And God damn. Draw, using that kind of clear line too, with perspective drawing, you you said it yourself like you 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 can't hide so yeah. when you need to know where that horizon line is even for simple things like where the top of the pants go yeah man, you exactly. fuck that line up man you make it go convex instead of right. concave you you screwed up the drawing it, 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 you're absolutely right i mean if and i i could see myself when i started out like i would have drawn you know the horizon line i would have put that figure in a box which i used to do quite often to figure out you know where that other foot might be oddly enough because you can draw everything inside of a box and that's what i would i would do that's interesting yeah i'm man. kind of shocked by that i always think of the way you're able to draw shaolin cowboy from all these different per perspectives uh flipping foreshortening everything always in movement i would never think that it would go back to like you doing figures in boxes that's that's because my mind's I, blown i just didn't know and and uh it's so funny because I remember when I first met Mobius and I was trying to figure out because my boss at Hanna Barbero said, you said, eh, did you ever study perspective in school? And he said, yeah, mm, we didn't learn very much. <laughs> and I go home and I'm trying to draw and I, and I was working on helping out in super prints and I was trying these spaceships and Mobius had come over to, to see me uh, because he'd forgotten his, uh, he was like a, almost like a, a man purse kind of a thing they used to call them those days at my at, at my house the first time we met in my apartment and he came in and he saw it and i was trying to draw this spaceship in perspective and it was all boxy i mean everything there was no curves in this thing at all box box everything was like hard edge because i'm just trying to figure out how perspective works and he thought i was doing ge geometric designs like you they almost look like those things in tron but I was trying to draw them realistically, but he goes, well, we should get you some work on it because you, you're very good at drawing these geometric <laughs> ships. And I was like, yeah, yeah. It wasn't my intent. I never told him, but, uh, but yeah, I would draw, because I had a teacher, I'd give, like you guys, you ever had a thing where you're looking for that, how to draw the human figure. And you're looking for that, you know, make a circle, I'll make an oval, and I'll make a box and blah, 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 blah. And it adds up to, you know, a Frank Rosetta drawing. But, <laughs> But it is there is none. There not, it really isn't. There's just little guides. But I had a, a life drawing teacher, and I'm having trouble drawing the head. And he drew the head, a head, and he drew a box first. And he drew it within that box. And gosh, I've lost it. But I had that drawing for the longest time because I'd look at it and go, oh, yeah, the, the eyes line up. And they, if you go around the edge, they line up over the top of the, the, the ear. And the, no, the bottom of the ear lines up over the bottom of the nose. And it just... It was just one of those little things that helped me see things that way. One of, was... one of the most interesting sort of uh, figure constructions that I've probably ever have seen was Art Adams' uh, underdrawing for that classic X-Men cover, probably the first issue where it's the whole team. And it's the one where, uh, like, John Romita Sr. like composed the final piece. And then you see what uh, Art Adams kind of like built on top of what John Romita did. And he draws like a wire frame around the face, at least back back then. He would draw this like very interesting like wire frame around the Ooh. face and it would, he would let himself see like the planes of the cheeks, the jowl, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then a couple other like bits that you just don't necessarily think of in your like crudest, like learn how to draw. Cause you know, you're concerned with eyes and nose and mouth, but his stuff is like, the planes of like the cheek is not this like the way like a little kid draws it it, it goes in like it's it's like this yeah. weird little ball that's up here and then you have the jowl connected to it and like you could just see how he could build it and it's just like i was saying at the beginning when you when you drew that hand holding the knife for me when i had it at an awkward spot and like your drawing was like a couple you know five lines but seeing where the tendon was here in connection with the wrist bone like i learned something there i mean for me i keep repeating this but perspective was just so important 
and uh, like if you, you know, just in terms of drawing like a crowd scene, because it, it can tell you what you know what the proportions are and everything. Because if you get a, if you get one figure from one figure, you can tell the proportions of what everybody else is going to be in perspective. Because from that, you can draw out from your uh, your your horizon line. The, the lines that you need to say, okay, this would be the, the size of the figure next to a car. And then you know the size of the car, but you know what the size of the car is going to be because a car, a guy standing next to a car is just a certain height. And a lot, a lot of times, uh, you know, I always correct you, I'll see a guy standing next to a car and he's either so big, he never fit in the car. And I mean, you know, and once again, there's, I'm being very literal, but you know, inside, sometimes inside a car, like, the guy will be like, geez, that guy must be a giant in there because <laughs> he's big head in there. But Jeff, but, when, when you would, uh, you know, you, you work pretty big yeah. and uh, the vanishing points would be sometimes like far off yeah. the page. Yeah. Would you do that thing where it's like you measure no, like, uh, by the edge and do yeah. that sort of thing and then grid it off that way? No, because there was a guy in hand of that do that. And I tried doing it and I just... I would get distracted by all the lines I'd have to draw in mm-hmm. to sort of do that. So what I would do is I'd like glue like a, a long, uh, I'd get like a piece of uh, those days of what I used, it. maybe it was a piece of uh, foam core and I would tape it to the edge of my board and a really long, you know, a uh, yardstick or, or T square, not a T square, but just a you know, measuring. And I would use that, and I'd draw my, I'd figure out where my horizon line was, and I would, I would literally draw out, you know, to the vanishing like point. Oh, there'd be like a yard, I'd be sticking out a yard off my table. <laughs> and sometimes I would glue like one ruler to another ruler, so I'd have that extra because I was still trying to figure it out, and uh, get, you know, get it out far enough to where it would look convincing. But and then when I had my dad build me another board, he actually, I was like, we talked about this on that, that, that interview. Uh, a, 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 a section where I had these wings, I could attach the side of my board, <laughs> like I so I could draw out to that. But I don't have to do that as much anymore because that's the thing that, that Mobius told me once. He said, "I spent forty years learning how to draw so that I could forget about it." Mm. And I can't say I've forgotten about it, but it does get easier just from repetition. I mean, it's like I don't know if it's muscle memory, but you know, this is going to be like that, and that's going to be like that. You know that the, the the hand works a certain way, and there's a certain I mean, like hands, you know, I would, I, people, you know, there's that, that roundness that you get when you look at it, there's a roundness to like here and the, and the fingers aren't like, they're not even and they don't, they don't all meet that, you know, the, the meat part of the hand at the same place. They kind of, they follow around it, but you don't always see that, you know, at the beginning, because you, because I don't know about you guys, but I was always look at the superficial part of it. And, I, and if I copied a drawing, I didn't try to understand what the drawing is. I was just trying to copy the line. Right. Or even a photograph. If you're using a photograph, I'm copying the line on the photograph. I'm not trying to understand why that line is there. And that's, uh, you know, and that's, that's why you see some guy that they'll trace photographs. And you can say, yeah, it looks okay. But they don't understand that photograph that they're, they're drawing. I remember, I, Ed, I sent you that, that piece that Mobius had did of... Uh, uh, it was a, 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 a shot from a John Ford film with Henry Fonda and Walter Brennan in it, my darling Clementine. And I think he just put a photograph and he went over, but you couldn't tell. Cause, God, he just reinterpreted it completely. But he yeah. understood what he was drawing. The, mm-hmm. the best, of, the best of those guys could could do that sort of thing. Like everybody rags on the Wally Wood three rules. You know, why copy what you can trace? Blah blah blah. But and he would construct his collages of found materials and cars and whatever. But like when that final ink line is put down, that's a Wally Wood illustration, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there were guys. I mean, I, I, I remember the Fanner Graphics did that. That they used to do that thing where they would like call people out that were swiping stuff, and they did that to Keith Giffen. Right. And uh, I have to say that you know, you know, why would you copy like a hand holding a frying pan, man? <laughs> Those things that got, you know, you know uh, I just think I just wonder if some of those guys are like, what obscure, what obscure artist can I find that I can rip off and nobody will ever find out? No, no, it's impossible. Because <laughs> you know, they can look on the internet and find it. So it's beautiful, Jeff, uh, celebrating Mobius, taking a look at the long tomorrow, 
And uh, before we get out of here, man, do you want to point people in a direction? When is that new Shaolin Cowboy coming out? I think it's the week of May 18th. Uh, and it's a seven issue series. It's the longest thing I've ever done. 205 pages. Each issue is summer 28, summer 29. Uh, the last one is 38 or 39 pages. Wow. It's an extravaganza. Yeah. And I've seen a couple of those issues, man. The imagination does not cease. It's incredible. It gets so, goofier. <laughs> so with, uh, without further ado, We'll step the heck off. Jimmy, give them some marching orders. We'll be out of here. Read more Jeff Darrow comics. Mm -hmm.